a wonderful pen and ink drawing by an artist named Zoe It's on a snake that is shedding, obviously. And um, in addition to being just a wonderful piece of art, it really captures the basic theme of this talk which is of something coming into being and something passing away. And that's, and what I think is really quite wonderful about this uh, drawing is at first glance, you can't quite tell. It looks like the skin is just as much alive and maybe more so than the snake whose body is here. Uh, there's also a little snake wrapped around here, kind of a nice touch. Um, so, the snake is never just static. We are never just static. No animal, nothing in life, nothing in the inorganic world of mountains and plains and oceans and even stars, nothing is static. Nothing is stationary. Nothing is just, that's the way it is and that's the way it will always be. No, everything is in motion and everything is changing. Now, the other nice thing that this drawing illustrates is how the new is emerging from the old. And they're both present simultaneously. It's not as though that skin just flies off and there's a brand new snake. It's also true. That it's not that a human being flies away and a whole new human being comes into being. It's a slow, evolutionary process. So, um, if, oh, one other thing I wanted to say. Uh, for some people, the first time you see that snake picture, there is something in us, rightly so, that is a little bit uh, not a little bit revulsed by a snake. We have a built-in sort of defensive mechanism because snakes can be dangerous. And our ancestors had to deal with dangerous snakes. So there's a kind of thing about spiders and snakes uh, that's built into our emotional system. And I also think that's kind of a nice point to think about the that snake has got a wonderful story to tell, but your first impulse might be, I want to get away from it, I don't want it, I don't like it. And the story of evolution has a quality like that. that it's one of the most magnificent stories that can be told, and yet, on first hearing, it was thoroughly rejected. So this is a much nicer um, uh, icon. It's, it's a Celtic rendering of the snake, and uh, this one is not not supposed to scare you. You need to do that. Okay. So what the snake illustrates is that being and becoming are both happening at the same time, um, and even in particle mechanics, which is just back to the notion of <coughs> atoms and molecules. A particle in motion, we think of as having, it's the most natural thing to think of it, it has a position coordinate. Like I'm standing here right now, I have a position coordinate. Things on your GPS or when you do Google Maps, anything, you're, everything's giving you position, position, position. But the reality is that the motion of the world is based on two coordinates. Every point, every atom, every particle has both a position and a velocity or momentum. As in physics, we like to talk about the momentum, but it's essentially it's like the velocity. So the, there's, whenever you see position, there's also velocity. My velocity has to be, with respect to this room, is pretty much zero right now. But now I'm, I'm moving and the positions are changing. And with evolution, we don't see the velocity, like we, just in the case of particles, we don't see the velocity. We don't see the fact that the present is changing right before our eyes, is evolving. So, being and becoming are both happening.
happening at the same time. And the, you can think of the two coordinates of all the basic particles in the physical world of the position and the momentum. The position is like the being, and the momentum is the becoming. But they're both there together. The other thing I thought that's kind of important about the metaphor of the, of the snake is that this transition time is when both the thing that you're going to be and the thing you are are both present. It's a very kind of sensitive time. It's a vulnerable time. It's a time of crisis. We have to have a very expansive deck. And we gather some of the most interesting black snake skins because the black snakes like to go under there when they're ready to shed because it's a, it's, they're vulnerable. And they want to get away and out of the sun and they want to be protected. So they're seeking protection while that's happening because it's a very sensitive time. At a time of crisis. I would like to use that metaphor to talk about our time of say the 20th century or the mid 19th century when the discovery of evolution first made its appearance. But this was like a vulnerable and sensitive time of human understanding and, and human knowing, a time when people are sensitive and vulnerable, a time of crisis. So into this time comes a very interesting man, uh, Teilhard de Chardin, he roughly has a life that is contemporary with Albert Einstein. He was born in the late 1880s, or in the early 1880s, and he died in 1955. He was born in the Auvergne region of France. His father was from a kind of landed gentry family, which is a gentleman farmer. Their wealth was essentially in land. His mother was a grand niece of the great French philosopher, philosopher Voltaire. Here's something that Teilhard said, one of his very important, to my way of thinking, one of his important things. <coughs> seeing. He was very interested in, in seeing. Like seeing that snake. Seeing that it wasn't necessarily dangerous, seeing that it was two things at once. But seeing in general, he says, one can say the whole of life lies in seeing. This is probably why the history of the living world can be reduced to the elaboration of ever more perfect eyes at the heart of the cosmos. And he gets even more pointed. See or perish. This is the situation imposed on every element of the universe by the gift of existence. Now he's speaking as a philosopher here. And these are rather lofty statements. But they carry some very pithy and accurate uh, things. And I would like to add to this learning. One could say that the whole of life lies in learning from what one sees. It's one thing to see. It's another thing to learn from what one sees. And that is probably why the history of the living world can be reduced to the elaboration of ever more perfect understanding at the heart of the cosmos. It will never be complete. We're just finite creatures. But we do seem to have the gift of being able to participate and to bring into our own minds much of what's going on. And I think you could say learn or perish. If we don't learn, we'll perish. So here is the young K.R. and he writes, what is my first memory? I was five or six. My mother had snipped a few of my curls. I picked one up and held it close to the fire. The hair was burnt up in the fraction of a second. The terrible grief assailed me. I had learned that I was perishable. Isn't that an important lesson to learn? <clears throat> then the young Tayar, when he was about seven, he found a metal plow hitch obviously in one of the barns, and he treasured that plow hitch. He thought it was incorruptible and everlasting, and then he found that it was rusting. It was rusting away. And he writes that I threw myself on the ground, and very dramatic, he says, I shed the bitterest tears of my existence. 
So there is an awakening to perishability, to decay, to death. And these are very powerful forces that play a role in how people are going to regard evolution. But for Teo, it was also an awakening to dynamism, motion, and change. That didn't happen when he was seven. But as he got a little older, that shock of perishability it was like he had discovered that he was a physician coordinator. He hadn't yet discovered that he was also a momentum coordinator, that he was in motion, that he was flow, that he was changed, and that that was just as real as being stopped in motion at any point. So that he was awakened to evolution and continuous creation that's taking place. He entered the Jesuit order as a young man. He had a religious devotion. He was one of his children with a very strong religious sensibility. And uh, he attended a seminary in Hastings, which is on the island of Jersey. At this time, at the turn of the century, the Catholic Church was still in trouble after the French Revolution. There was still a lot of anti-Catholic feeling in France, even though huge amount of part of the population in France was Catholic. So they closed all the seminaries, and the Jesuits had to move their seminary to the Isle of Jersey, just uh, in the channel, uh, in the English channel. So this is where Teilhard was, and it was there when he was at the Isle of Jersey. I don't know how he got hold of it, because I don't think the Jesuit seminary is going to have this book. But he started reading Henri Bergson, who was a French philosopher of that era, who had recently published Creative Evolution. Now remember, we're about almost a half century from Darwin's publication. But he was very knowledgeable about evolution, and there were many people at that time, even though the general public was quite ignorant of, of evolution, or hostile to it. And he wrote this book on creative evolution. So, <clears throat> reading that book, Teilhard hit on this. He, like all good Catholic theologians, is taught um, the philosophy of Aristotle. And Aristotle had this dualism of matter and spirit, or matter and form. And it seemed to him that this idea of evolution was more to the point. Now, actually it turns out that I think Aristotle and evolution go really together quite nicely. But we're not going to discuss that today. So what he saw was this, this whole thing about is the world material, is it spiritual? He saw some kind of resolution of that. And that what's really happening is that's the wrong question. That's the wrong way to be looking at it. What we're looking at is a movement through time of an evolving universe. And he also said he was collecting fossils while he was in the seminary. He wasn't studying paleontology in the seminary. He was learning to be a priest. But he was already doing quite a lot of paleontology as an amateur. So he was collecting all the fossils on the uh, island of Jersey. And he says that the word evolution seemed to connect with the extraordinary density and intensity with which the English landscape appeared to me, especially at sunset, when the Sussex woods seemed to be laid with all the fossil life that I was exploring, from one quarry to another in the soils of the well. And I think we probably all had that experience of the kind of magical time at sunset, when everything seems to acquire a kind of intensity that you can tell. And then Teilhard wrote, the great cosmic attributes of Christ only assume their full dimension in the setting of an evolution that is both spiritual and convergent. In 1914, Bergson's Creative Evolution was placed on the Catholic Church Index of Forbidden Books, which meant that if you were Catholic, you were not allowed to read that book under pain of mortal sin. And in 1919, church authorities ordered Taylor to stop teaching. So at that point, 
Tayar began a two decade long sojourn in paleontological fieldwork in China, where he did quite a bit of interesting work. He did some discoveries on what was known as Peking Man. He was a very respected paleontologist. Uh, so he basically, having been silenced by the Catholic Church, he went to the field. He went to work with his hands and to discover and see what he could do that way. <coughs> So, what we have is the universe which is ceaseless, restless, in motion, dynamic, becoming, evolving from an origin of the Big Bang 17 billion years ago. That was where Teilhard and many others had suddenly awakened. We have the Church, Bible, Quran, Hinduism, other holy books. These, for very good reason, I'm, I'm not. Uh, trying to uh, unnecessarily degrade religion. But I want to point out that the way these holy books work, and I'll tell you why they work that way, is that these are about eternal truths that don't change. They're about scripture. It's finished. We don't have any, we don't have the 2016 edition of the New Testament which has got some new stuff. We don't have that. It's, it's, it's anathema to religion to have any good scripture or any additions to the Quran, Quran. You have new crackpot prophets who are always appearing, but prophecy, as far as the mainstream religions are concerned, is complete. Uh, revelation is complete. And moral laws, by all means, are eternal. You can ask Justice Antony Scalia about that. He will tell you that there's no changing any of the laws that were extant back in 500 BC. Um, and this all comes from the origin of human beings that is 2,500 years ago. So, why is there this kind of conflict? So, I'm going to have a little interlude now going to uh, pause in the story of Teilhard de Chardin, and I want to just give a little mini lesson on why are religion and science in conflict? Because they are in conflict. And it's, it's not helpful to say there's, not, there's no problem. There is a problem. So what is science about? Science is about what is true by observation, measurement. What is scientifically true? Now, we use the word truth in other categories in philosophy and in religion. But I'm going to bias it towards scientific truth and, if you, and I'm, I'm not going to uh, require that there is no truth except scientific truth. But the truth that I'm talking about here is scientific truth. Religion is not, that's not what religion is about. What religion is fundamentally about is how to live. It may not describe it that way, but that's really what's going on. That's why the laws of, of the religious laws that you have to observe are very important. That's why religions take um, heretics very seriously. It's about how to live, and these are kind of perpendicular to one. They're kind of two different dimensions of human life. So first of all, I want to talk about religion and, it, and about how to live. And I want to illustrate that with this photograph of these Amish men who are building a barn. And this isn't all, just in this picture, there are a whole lot more of these men. There must be like 40 of them. They're all from this Amish community. They all have the same religious faith. They share that faith, and what they do when somebody needs a barn, the way they do it is they all get together and they build that barn, and that's how each family can get a barn. So for a strongly social species like human beings, we're social. That's what gives us this great power, I and mean, that's why this building exists, that's why this piece of electronics exists. 
We couldn't do that if we were all working alone like orangutans. Orangutans are primates. They're very close to us in a lot of their uh, biology, but they're very solitary. They're not social animals. They don't make iPhones. But, so what happens is, to get a society to work, individuals have to give up some of their autonomy. They have to give up their selfishness. They have to give up themselves for the group's benefits. But that group benefit is much bigger than any individual's contribution, and it comes back to everybody, and they all share it. This is the most fundamental problem humans face. You look at the presidential race right now. It's, this is exactly what it's about. It's about how do we share the benefits of a society? And there are many people who say, basically, I don't want to share. Or there are people who are basically just freeloaders. And that's the tension between these two poles. On one side saying, there are a bunch of no goods who are freeloading off of all of us who are working hard. And there are other people who say, I don't want to be responsible for anybody else. I'll just drive on the roads and go to schools and uh, hope the power stays on and so on. So this is not easy. It's not solvable. It's not easily solvable. It's always messy. So religion is how to live, yes, and individuals give up themselves for the group's benefits and all share the group's benefits, but religion offers something that just ordinary secular life so far has not been able to offer. Individuals do this because of belief. Because of their belief. And you know the fundamental the, the, the translation of the word Islam is submission. It's submission to the word that Muhammad wrote in the Quran, which tells you how to share how to deal with life, how to take wives, how not to take somebody else's wife, how to take care of the elderly, and all and on. It's all about how to live. And you must obey, you must submit. You can't opt out. And if you try to opt out, there will be people who will try to punish you. So it's based very strongly on this idea of following the Quran, and so much of the Quran is very reasonable. It's a very good recipe for having a large society that is functioning, not too selfish, not too exclusive, etc., etc. Um, but Christianity brings another dimension to this, which is why should I share with someone else, or care about someone? You should do it because you love God. You should do it because of this upsurge of love that you have. And it makes you feel so good to love God and to take care of the poor. It makes you feel so good to do the right thing. It makes you feel so good to love God and not get into someone, other's, someone else's wife. It makes you feel good to do the right thing. So these are a little bit different uh, psychological motivations, but religion doesn't just say, do it because if you don't, if you don't do it, we'll send, we'll send the sheriff over and we'll get arrested. You don't do well when the only reason you do something is because you don't want to get arrested or you don't want to get penalized. It's a very poor set of motivations. The motivation of wanting to do it because in love is far more powerful. So, here's the important lesson here. The human mind did not evolve first for scientific truth. It had much more uh, important things to evolve for. It's for the reproductive success of a human group. And religious belief in institutions promote reproductive success. Well, how do they do that? Let's go back to the Amish years. First of all, if all these men and their wives, and if they had any children, were isolated and had to homestead on their own, you're going to have to chop down the tree, you're going to have to cut it up, you're going to 
going to have to raise it up and make some kind of shelter. You're not going to make a barn in the back. And you're all going to work alone. You're going to just have a very primitive barn. You're probably not going to have very many animals. You're not going to be able to put up hay in that barn. You're going to be very restricted in what you can do. But if you work together, then after this barn is built, we'll move to the next family. And with the power, the multiplying power of group action, it's far more than a bunch of little individuals working alone. And the religious belief and the religious practices of these men, the prayers they say, the feelings they have, the families they uh, bring them to, this is what makes it work. So, here's where the modern atheists have a problem that I don't think they have completely faced up to. A religious belief that is scientifically untrue, that's scientifically false, but it's reproductively successful. That is, if like those Amish well, folks, you have a very successful hay, you have lots of animals, you make lots of cheese and Meat, and you have eight children, and they do the same thing, and then they have eight children, and this grows exponentially. That religious belief has very practical physical consequences. So, if, uh, if it's unscientifically untrue, but it's reproductively successful, it's going to grow, propagate, and dominate human culture rather than science. In fact, uh, there's a whole branch of psychology now that is based on uh, working on the way the mind evolved and the kinds of the environments that it had to evolve through and the problems that it had to solve. It's called evolutionary psychology. Um, and what evolutionary, evolutionary psychology predicts is that evolution itself should be strongly condemned and resisted by fervent fundamentalist groups. Let me say that again. The theory of evolution, if we put it in those terms, predicts that it should be rejected vigorously by religious groups. So we come to this problem of science of this true and religion how to live. <clears throat> and here's where we run into trouble. Now for the most part, before evolution came on the scene, science and religion, well we had, there actually have been clashes for the last 100 years between science and religion. But the most recent one and the one that's still boiling away today is about evolution. So, uh, what happens is, so here we have science, let me look back here. Here's science working on its coordinates. It's working on what is true. And what it finds what is true often exposes the age and often erroneous understanding of the origin of nature of the universe, the earth, and life. So evolution undermines the biblical account of the origin of human beings. It's undermining it. And it also undermines the direct role of a human like God who wants, loves, hates, and punishes in making people and fostering the success of the tribe. Now, if you want to pull that rug out from under religion, you're pulling out a very, this is a very big deal. So it's not surprising that a threat to the belief system that binds otherwise free people together in a social or religious group, it's life-threatening to the group. Those barns aren't going to get built. Those cheeses aren't going to get made and the pork salted away. And that's why you hear things like death to apostles, death to heretics. It literally was true. Heretics were burned at the stake. It's because, no pun intended, the stakes are high. The stakes are high. Now, as scientific truths become more essential to human life, and erroneous beliefs about the natural world harm reproductive success of cultures as a whole. If you hold an erroneous scientific belief, it may not be important at all. But on the other hand, it could be important. Think about people who get polio because they don't believe in vaccines.
vaccines. Um, scientific truths can be in a culture that denies them, they can be harmful to reproductive success. I mean, this is a little bit of a cartoon, but the children get polio, they don't reproduce, families aren't successful, and it's reproductively unsuccessful. So, that's the end of the interlude on why science and religion are in conflict. I hope, I hope that gives you some idea of where this comes from. It's, it's not trivial. Alright, so, when challenged by a new scientific discovery that contradicts past belief, what to do? What do you do? Suppose you're a devout religious person. Well, one very straightforward thing you can do is deny the science. If it's against my religion, my religion is the highest standard. Everything's got to match that. If, it, if, it, if it's undermining my religion, bad science. But the other thing that you can do is grow your faith. Grow your belief system. And that's what Teilhard did. Teilhard grew his faith. So, growth for human beings means seeing, and trying to see as accurately as you can, uh, challenging what you see, checking it against observation, and so on. That's the, that's the activity of science. <clears throat> and learning, learning from the universe, not from uh, some Ayatollah back in the holy city of Gaul, who, which is the Iranian, where all the Iranians are, and they make pronouncements about the world. And incidentally, Darwin's books were banned, are banned in Iran. Uh, so that's not who you learn from. You learn from the universe. You let the universe speak to you. You let the stars speak to you. You let the atoms and molecules in the living creatures around speak to you. You have to learn how to understand that language. But you let the universe speak.
that just scientific knowing is not going to be able to touch. So, KR is using Christian language, Christian symbols, Christian words. Both of them are present. One of the things that he talks about is he, he Christ is not just the usual way people think about that. And this bothers me. This bothers people who think about Christ. Why are you doing saying that? I don't like that. He believed that he, he took Christ and projected him into the whole cosmos. Well, he's God, as far as Taylor is concerned. And so, of course, he's throughout, shot through and throughout the universe. So, he pushes that concept, and he's using what he has to work with. He's got Christianity to work with. That's what he's got to work with. It's, that's the skin he's using. So, the cosmic Christ, well, Teilhard certainly got this far, which is, the cosmic Christ is not a white man with a beard and long hair and a nightgown. Which, to be honest, is the interior psychological image that many, many Christians have of Jesus Christ. This is not Taylor's image. He writes, throughout my whole life, during every moment I've lived, the world has gradually been taking on light and fire for me until it has come to envelop me in one mass of luminosity flowing from within, the purple hush of matter fading imperceptibly into the golden spirit to be lost finally in the incandescence of, look at that, a personal universe. This is what I have learned from my contact with the earth. The diaphany of the divine at the heart of a glowing universe. The divine radiating from the depths of matter and flame. And this is really quite important. This division between the material world is just matter. It's dirty, it's, it dies, it goes away. But what we really want to be is spiritual. This is a mistake. What Teilhard really was trying to pull into his thinking was that matter and spirit are entwined together like a very fine weave. That the divine, he used the, the uh, idea that the matter, the material world, is like the sheath, like the covering of divinity. That the divinity in the world, the godliness is in the world, is shot through all the atoms and molecules. You don't find it, it's not standing outside. There are a couple of things he said. I won't give you too much of Teilhard. Teilhard, I told uh, Anna that Teilhard should have taken a course in writing so he wouldn't write so much purple prose. <laughs> but, uh, so he writes things like this. Blessed be you, harsh matter. Blessed be you, matter. It's a prayer. It's like, how can you make a dirty prayer like that to the material world, which is, which there's so many traditions of religion that think of matter as dirty, as of the devil. So, barren soil, southern rock, you who you only the violence, you who force us to work and you and eat. Blessed be you, perilous matter, violence, untamable passion, you who unless we fetter you will devour us. Uh, it's a kind of different attitude than in the Genesis account in which Adam and Eve are driven out of this wonderful garden and told to bear your child in pain and to have the nettles and the weeds choke out your plants and to earn your bread with sweat and toil and hard work and suffer the pain of birth. The, this is, they are saying blessed, blessed be you, worship God. Well, I won't go through the rest of his work and prose, but uh, it's a very different sense about the material world because it's, it's 
luminous. It's alive. It's very full of the most important substance of existence, which is the mind, which is God. Teilhard also introduced a phrase, I, I, I meant to find a French translation of that, he wrote it in French. It's translated as the sense of the earth. Now this is back in the 1920s. So the phrase sense of the earth should be understood to be passionate concern for our common destiny, which draws the thinking part of life ever further onward. In principle, there is no feeling which has a firm foundation in nature or greater power. And what he says about this is that it awakens so belatedly the human, the human species. This didn't come forward. It's only lately that it's come. And he's writing in 1920. It can become explicit only when our consciousness has expanded far, expanded beyond the far too restricted circles of family country, race, and it's finally discovered that the only truly natural and real human unity is the spirit of the earth. This is written kind of rather well with people who say, we're all on this planet together. We can't divide up as Muslims and Christians and Russians and Americans. This is crazy. This has got to stop. We've reached a point in which So evil is a very, it's a very 
very slippery word. Um, so, what about suffering? And I want to now bring in, I want to bring on stage, so to speak, a different voice. Uh, there are many voices that speak about the human condition, in particular from the viewpoint of biology. And I'm not going to bring in a different voice. I'm going to bring in Lauren Heisman, who, as a 20th century biologist, he died, I think, in the late 70s and wrote for most of uh, the latter part of the 20th century. He felt that his uh, calling and that his inspiration was Henry Thoreau and that he wanted to write about the world around him in the way that Henry Thoreau did. Or not, he wasn't trying to imitate Thoreau, but that was his inspiration and he was kind of an essayist like that. So um, he finds himself at one point on a beach in Spain, a fancy resort. And uh, this is a long essay, I only excerpt a certain part of it. But it's got a very great beach, and he's out on the beach looking at the beach after the tide is going out. The place is called Costable. The beaches of Costable are littered with the debris of life. Shells are cast out in windrows. A hermit crab fumbling for a new home in the depths is tossed naked ashore where the waiting gulls cut into pieces. Along a strip of wet sand that marks the ebbing and flowing of the tide, death walks hugely in many forms. Even the torn fragments of green sponge yield bits of scrambling life, striving to return to the great mother of the sea that is nourished and protected. Ahead of me, over the projecting point, the gigantic rainbow, incredible perfection, had sprung, shimmering into existence. Somewhere towards its foot, I discerned a human figure standing. It seemed to be within the rainbow, though unconscious of his position. He was gazing, gazing fixedly at something in the sand. In a pool of sand and silt, a starfish had thrust its arms up stiffly and was holding its body away from the stifling mud. It's still alive, I venture. Yes, he said. And with a quick, gentle movement, he picked up the star and spun it over my head and far out to the sea. It sank in a burst of spume and the water roared once more. It may live, he said. The offshore pool is strong enough. The stars throw well. One can help. There's a biblical injunction that runs, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Neither why this matters to it. All that matters to it. Don't worry. Eisen writes, but I do love the world. It's small. The things beat in the strangling circle. The bird singing, which flies and falls. It is not seen again. I love the lost ones. The failures of the world. Suddenly, so I saw and picked up a living star spinning it far out into the waves. I understand, I said, calling and running the throat. I picked up and flung another star, perhaps far out on the rim of the space, a genuine star was similarly seized and flung. I flung, and I flung again, while all about us roared the insatiable waters. I picked up a star whose two feet ventured timidly among my fingers. But well, like a true star, it cried soundly into the light. I saw it 
with an unaccustomed clarity, and I cast it far out. With it, I flung myself as fortune. For the first time in some unknown dimension of existence, the Darwin's tangled back of unceasing struggle, selfishness, and death had risen incomprehensibly. Throw it. He 
He wrote, when the signs of age begin to mark my body, and still more when they touch my mind, when the illness that is to diminish me or carry me off strikes from without or is born within me, when the painful moment comes when I suddenly awaken to the fact that I am ill or growing old, and above all, at that last moment when I feel I am losing hold of myself, and absolutely passive with the hands of the great unknown forces that have formed me in all those dark things. Oh God, God, he's praying to God. Grant that I may understand that it is you, provided only my faith is strong, who are painfully parting the fibers of my being in order to penetrate to the very marrow of my substance and bear me away. Within you. So Teilhard died on Easter Sunday, 1955, in New York City. His voluminous writings released and published finally throughout the 1950s. I think I got a hold of the phenomenon of man in the early 60s. And the most uh, kind of important book that he published was The Phenomenon of Man, which was finally released in 1955, although it was written. That's where we're going to stop and have questions or discussion. Any questions? Yes. Um, can we turn off the how we turn off the slides? So I started Catholic school probably the same year that they are died. And I don't remember evolution being an issue throughout my where were you? In Rome. In Rome. Uh, and this was pre, obviously pre. Did they discuss it in your teaching? I mean, I was certainly familiar with it, and I remember the input being, and of course, in 1955, I was in kindergarten, so I'm sure they didn't talk about it a whole lot. But um, what I remember from the, you know, whatever discussion of evolution there was, was that there was not a that there was not a conflict between accepting the scientific theory of evolution and at the same oh. time accepting not the literal truth of the Bible, but the truth of the Bible in its religious right. sense. One of the factors that enters into, I mean, I went to Catholic schools also, and one of the factors that enters into it is that the Catholic Church was definitely not going to allow to teach this kind of stuff. If you want to believe that evolution happens and you're studying in the biology department, fine. But you're not going to bring it into, you're not going to talk about the cosmic Christ. You're not going to do that. Uh, and here's why it's different for Catholics. You remember the Protestant Revolution? So what the Protestant Revolution did was reject the authority of the Pope, reject the authority of, of the period, reject religious authority, and replace it with the Bible. And there's a great strain in Protestantism, especially the more evangelical sects, not so much the, the Episcopals and uh, Lutherans, they're much more like the Catholics. But the evangelical sects are very big on reading the Bible. The Bible, if you want to know what's up, you read the Bible. That's where it is. So for the Catholic Church, because of the authority structure, the Pope could change if he wanted to, if he was moved to. We can sort of say, well, maybe that's not so important. Catholics are not so sensitive to changing the interpretation of Scripture. But if you don't, because they have this boss, the big boss, who will always tell them what's going to be what. The Protestants are floating free. That book is what they have. If that book goes down, you don't have anything. If that book is eroded and its credibility is, is challenged, if its truthfulness doesn't seem perfect, the 
word they like to use is inerrancy. That is the more fun word. So, Catholics have this distinction. Yes? We are. Can you, can you speak up a little bit? Yeah. Early in the talk, we talked about the development of society. It seemed to start with Christianity and the religious implications tied with the dogma and all that business. How does civilization, or that discussion, completely skip Plato's Republic and the society described there, which I don't believe deals with concerns with any religious beliefs. I think he was dodging the bullet of the religious at that time. Mm -hmm. So I hate to see that, you know, we have, religion has dominated, chased him around, Socrates and those boys eventually got the bullet from him, and religion took over. How does the whole world ignore Plato's Republic and societies and ills? Because the people who believe that have more children. Right. And they, they have more children because they kill off people like Plato and Socrates. Whatever it takes, yes. Yeah. And I think, I feel now that's exactly where we are now after the succession of that same phenomenon over the millenniums that have occurred that were dominated by some ridiculous religious beliefs across the world. Well, here's the thing you might take some comfort in it's maladaptive. That did get people someplace. Well, uh, that, that, I think yeah, it's very maladaptive. Well, I take issue with that. I, I don't think religion got people anywhere. The, the interpretation of science deals all the way back when the first guy figured out he could get a sharp rock and, and cut open an animal or his enemy. That was science. Science is learning facts, truths, and are passed on and are useful by other humans universal. How do you stop men from fighting over women? Is that a part of science or one of religious things? It's a part of life. So how yeah, so that, I, I'm, that I'm is not trying to divide them up so 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 that is part of us. And I, I feel that, that the answer there lies in our connection. The snake was a wonderful example because doesn't our DNA and chromosome structure of 99 percent the same as that snake? Uh, well, living all, organisms, that's not the end. Yeah, there's a lot of, there's, there's tremendous, tremendous unity. But they're also, yeah, the, that they're, unity. They're, they're develop, there's the development genes that are very important and those are not. Yeah, but we are part, part of, yeah. as that snake is part of us. We, and now we have the knowledge to separate and identify our human and our animalistic. Let's hope we, do, we hope, let's hope we can do those two things I can get with. See and learn. Right, exactly. And religion has nothing to do with that. As far as as far as Chardin's discovery of trying to plug God into a place comfortably, his he never mentions a personal God that's going to send him up to heaven because he saw the cruelness of the world. And no God would create a world as cruel as we have here. So he saw maybe this God was all powerful and created this spinning mess. But there's no way that same wonderful God is going to listen to your prayer and then five Brazilian other humans with prayer and do squat on it. Well, in the in the context in which that happened historically, it made for very strongly uh, constructed groups of people that were reproductively successful, even if their behaviors were rather nasty. Yeah, uh, I agree 100%. That's Christianity in this country was spread by the sword. Well, uh, remember, there's there's what happens inside the group. And there's what happens when the groups are struggling against other groups. So one of the things that happens is that there's an enormous amount of interest in love, sharing, generosity, caring. But the other side of that coin is a nasty one of 
killing off those others. So there's, a, there's, there's two sides to the religious um, orientation and structure that it brings <coughs> to human society. It's not all just evil. It's, do you think that's part of religion? I think it's part of our natural survival. Call it what you want. Yeah. Well, I think the reason that, I think it's a mistake to give it any religious context. We're humans. Well, you're, you want to fight with religion today, and I yeah. think religion, you know, may need to, may need to deal with, with these kinds of critiques. But I don't think this is, this is a little too shallow and too superficial for understanding the whole dynamic of how human societies have held themselves together and evolved to be where they are. Yes? Um, what was uh, Teilhard's motivation <coughs> to sign the 1925 document um, renouncing his theories? What was behind that? Because he obviously didn't give up on it because no, genes, no. Um, uh, Next year, if you read, he was out. He was still in love with nature. Oh, yes. No, he, he, he was just prevented from being a public person. That's why he signed away, was the. But of course, he still had colleagues all over the world, and he, was, and he did visit them. They did let him visit them. You know, it's partly as long as he was out of France and the cardinals in France who, were, who hated him and wanted to get rid of him, they kind of. They didn't pay much attention. And remember, he couldn't publish, he couldn't teach, he couldn't lecture, he couldn't hold a professorship in a Catholic school. Um, what did he do it for a job? Like, so he teaching? He took vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience okay. as a Jesuit priest, and he took them seriously. He was he was a man of character, of a lot of character. Um, Remember the kind of easygoing way in which people slap things around the internet and bash each other on Twitter or whatever. We've entered a time of slightly chaotic human relations. The night, you know, a hundred years ago or 70 or 80 years ago, there was a much more civil society. It may not have been better, any better on the warlike aspect, but ordinary social relations were far more civil, far more thoughtful. Now so you just get through certain classes of the period that you're living in, uh, in a way. So, so uh, like you have to look at it um, with certain kind of classes from a period that you're living in. Because like right now, we usually throw stuff, we throw stuff away, but back then they probably held more tightly to certain principles and um, yes. I think that's yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, I was going to say that uh, my mother was raised Catholic, and uh, I was baptized Episcopal. I was raised Methodist. <laughs> <laughs> um, and when revolution, yeah, when, when revolution got I had a Jewish uncle too. When revolution came into being, I was in high school. When, when all the big stuff, you know, I was going into high school in New York. And I don't ever remember any major conflict. It didn't cause a conflict for me. Um, now, I'm not a scientific person. Mm -hmm. I took science and I appreciate science. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting. I, I, I really like well, to, to hear the scientific side. But I don't have a conflict between evolution and my God at uh, all. Yeah. But, I mean, that's fine, but uh, let me just explain why there wasn't any conflict. Um, biology has developed dynamically in the past 50, 70 years. The biology you might have been taught in high school if you were taught is so out of date. Everything is taught with a certain kind of attention given to the evolutionary origin of life. It plays such a big role in trying to understand everything. So you could go to high school, you could, you could go to school and never hear about evolution and, and take biology courses. But now, but now, uh, in any good
graduate school, the biology courses are going to be very strongly based on the evolutionary nature of life. And that, now, nobody can escape that. And so, more fundamentalist oriented people are hit with it. We didn't study evolution when I was in high school. I never thought much about it, to tell you the truth. It wasn't, it wasn't anything one way or another. I guess my point really is that, for me, the Bible is true. And I believe the Bible. I also believe science. And I don't have a conflict because, I'm, 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 unless there's something that happened that I haven't heard about, uh, science has not been able to refute, dispute, deny anything that's in the Bible. Uh, now, saying that, I mean, the Bible is not a historical novel. And it's, uh, it's a way of life. Like you said, the Bible is, is a way of life. And so, for me, it's not going to matter ultimately if I find out if there was a big bang or or how it came about. Um, You're not stuck I on, still You're not stuck on the Genesis account as a literal account. Six days, seven days was God's day, a thousand years. Was okay, God's so you day. have a way of no. incorporating. So to me, of, uh, my God is so big. But there are some people who yeah, say I just believe that my God is so big that my God could have done it any way He wanted to, and so I find it really interesting. When scientists find factual information, that, that, then I can actually, I can fit into it. It doesn't bother me. It, it's very, very interesting. I, I love to hear some of the stories about some of the things that have been found. I wish I could find more of uh, stuff that, that, you know, goes I can show you a map of the United States, and especially in the South, of all the schools that are teaching creation science, which is bogus science, really. And, yes, that's, that's and, and they're all over the place. They're very strongly concentrated. There's still, amazingly enough, in Tennessee, there's a lot of it. Um, so this is not a dead issue. I mean, it's, it's, it, you're comfortable, but there are a whole lot of people, especially in America, that are not comfortable. So I just don't understand why they're not comfortable. <laughs> Because, you know, my God is God, my God could have done anything he wanted to do. And so if you could prove to me exactly how God did it scientifically, that would be wonderful. Good moment. Actually, uh, this is a subject that really has a lot more to do with psychology. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe uh, neuroscience about the way we all have slightly different biases and the emotional wiring and the way we, our emotions interact with our um, capacities for knowledge and how we incorporate it. And you know that when people are arguing about religion and politics, it's really pointless. It doesn't have anything to do with logic. It really has much more to do with defending territory with defending the group, of, of making it known who your friends are, who, who your people are, sending signals out like that. I remember there was, a, it's a little bit past now, but there was a time when it was very important for some people who had experienced a very major conversion in their lives and had become more than Christians to say, Do you accept Jesus as your personal savior? <coughs> and if you didn't say it exactly in that formula, or if you responded, <coughs> Jesus is a, I believe Jesus is God. It's not, that's not good enough. You have to say, I accept Jesus as my personal savior. So we're talking about how we signal to one another. How we make connections and friendships and know who our enemies are and know who our friends are. And our friends are the ones who say back what we say. And people who say something different are maybe not necessarily our friends. And if they say something that's really different, they could be our enemies. 
This is very ancient coding and how, how the mind works. And uh, I think modern people are challenged a lot to get beyond that. Well, I hope science keeps learning. And, and I hope that the people of faith are able to listen. There's also this. One of the things that's always happening, which I just began with, was it's flowing. It's changing. And people who hold these beliefs, if they're, if they're scientifically untenable, and it continues to be so and so, are going to die. And a new generation will come in who say, what's the problem? Like this fellow said, you're wearing glasses. Uh, speak up. What, what when and did the Catholic Church get over this and reconcile? Or um, well, there was a pope that was elected pretty much when I was a kid, whose name was Pius XII. He was a little more of an intellectual, but he was still very conservative. But there were some very conservative popes. There was a pope, Leo XIII, who was a rather liberal pope. Uh, just before Taylor came on the scene, a uh, late, uh, kind of mid to late 19th century pope. And then the popes after that were enormously conservative and Italian. And um, it was just rough going. Pius XII, who was the pope in the 1950s, was not a whole lot better, really. Um, so his manuscripts had been circulating, he just couldn't publish. Jesuit order wouldn't then publish. Once he died, there was, there was who could sell it? I don't know how the copyrights were handled and how the authority was uh, distributed as well, publishing. There were many Jesuits who were definitely on his side. When he was trying to make that decision back in 1925, um, he, his Jesuit friends, many of them were professors of geology in the Catholic University in France. Uh, they tried to counsel them and they tried to think about what was the best thing to do. And some of them said, why don't you quit the order? Why don't you just quit and become a secular priest? You don't have to give up the priesthood, but you can then not be under that vow of obedience. And he actually had a, he went on a nation retreat. And he, when he came out of that retreat, he signed the paper. Yes. I was raised a Catholic and went to Catholic University. <coughs> and the, I believe at that time the presentation of Chardin was totally accepted because he never extracted God from the formula. His, his writings always Included God mm -hmm. as part of the process. What do you think he meant by God? That's what, that's what I think is accepted. I think God may have been the universe and the way, it's, the way it exists. And he didn't understand how it existed either. But he, he, was, he recognized the, the congruency of all living matter, you know, the change of, you know, must have knew with Einstein's research to all matters made up of atoms, which is energy, which no matter what it is, it's going to change. So I think he had a, a universal interpretation that but always had God in there somewhere. He didn't know where. But uh, I think that's that's what was accepted, is my understanding, at the university level of the Catholic acceptance. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring this to a close now. We can continue to have a discussion. But you can have it while you have a lemonade or a little bit of it. Um, this is prepared. So thank you all.